So our first session for this Global Trends track is um, our superstar session, which is uncover market opportunities and expand your product portfolio by understanding gamer preferences um, by App Annie. Unfortunately, uh, James could not join the uh, this session today, so I introduce Lexi Seidel from App Annie. <laughs> Sorry about that. All right. Well, I'll um, I'll hand it back over to James to kick us off then. All right. Great. Okay. Thanks. I guess the the, the joys of a uh, a webinar conference. Uh, interesting. Yeah. So I'm I'm James Gagan. I'm a uh, product manager here at App Annie, and today we're going to be talking about the complexity that exists in the mobile games market, and how you can use um, some data that we've developed to really help understand your market and in the end help launch more successful games. And before I move on, just put up this disclaimer a bit, give you a few minutes to read this. All right, so 10 years ago, gaming was very com was not very complex, not as complex as it is, as it is today. The audience um, was basically um, uh, not diverse as it was today. Um, and with the advent of mobile smartphones, all different kinds of people have started to play games. There have been young people who've started to play games, old people, and even couples. So with the advent of this really complex audience playing games, the mobile games industry started to get very complex as well. And so today we're seeing all different kinds of games being played within the industry. We're seeing arcade style runners, Tamagotchi games, sandbox games, hyper casual ASMR games, puzzle games, and so on. And so now that the industry has gotten so complex, mobile games publishers are asking a lot of questions about how can I better understand this complex new landscape? They're asking questions like, how can we size up market opportunities today in the most granular way? For example, are match three pu puzzle games or match plus build puzzle games growing faster in downloads? And what are the design features and monetization mechanics that work best inside such a game? For example, do starter packs or loot boxes monetize users best in Brazil? Which in-game features are driving user engagement the most? And so this is why we built Game IQ to help answer these kinds of questions. So Game IQ is really a game changer for mobile games publishers. We're combining a comprehensive taxonomy of game classifications that we've developed with App Annie's industry leading market estimates. We've developed this product over the past year and a half or so based on dozens of conversations with the world's major games publishers. And we're classifying 28,000 games within our new taxonomy. And here you can see our taxonomy goes really, really deep. We're classifying games along 111 subgenres, really deep levels like battle royale action games, first person shooters, poker, um, poker casino games. And for example, within puzzle, just to get a deeper look, we're classifying games along bubble shooter, match three, merge, room escape, and so on. And here's a look inside our product. On top of these classifications, we're also tagging apps along their art style, their gameplay features, IP. So we've selected IP here. You can see which games are using certain IPs like Jurassic Park or Kim Kardashian or Kingdom Hearts. And here's a look at just some of our tags that we're tagging games with. For example, within monetization, we're tagging apps that have advertising, subscription, and so on. Art style, we're tagging games with realistic, 2D, 3D, portrait. And gameplay features like 
multiplayer, customization, events, MMO, and so on. So within the App Store, it's not really telling you much about the game. It's telling you that this Marvel Strike Force game is a role-playing game. But within Game IQ, we're first telling you that this game is a core game. It's a core game versus uh, casual or casino. We're next telling you it's an RPG game. And beyond that, we're telling you it's a turn-based RPG game. In addition to the game's classification, we're also telling you the tags that this game has. For example, you can see here it has Marvel IP, the monetization mechanics it has, the features it has, and so on. So with all this information, um, it's a lot of data, and we've created a bunch of reports to help take advantage of this data and to um, better, um, better answer these kinds of questions. So for example, we have market sizing reports that can help tell you questions like, how are battle royale games performing in Europe? Or what's the total estimated revenue of Harry Potter IP games? Our insights generator report can help tell you how are games monetizing users? Which features are engaging users best? Which IPs are gl growing globally? Um, in terms of revenue or downloads. Our shared users report helps tell you what other game subgenres Battle Royale users are using. Our top games report tells you which sandbox games had the most downloads during the last month. And our top companies report zooms out to the company level All right, so yeah, the top companies report zooms out to the top company level to tell, give you company level insights. And on top, of all, we, we, on top of it all, we've built custom IQ to help tweak the taxonomy or to create your own. And so now I'll pass it on to Lexi to talk about some more details on some insights that can be gained from this data. Thank you, James. Um, I'm Lexi Cito. I'm a senior market analyst um, at App Annie, and I am one of the people that's been lucky to work with a lot of this great mobile data. So I'll take you through um, the next section on how we can look at game IQ in action, uncovering market opportunities, expanding your product portfolio, and amplifying your UA and marketing. So we'll start off kind of with a, a very open kind of picture of the market here. So what we're seeing, um, I mean, most of you uh, attending probably know this, but mobile gaming is the fastest growing form of gaming and it's the world's most popular form of gaming. So in 2020, we estimate that um, by the end of this year, we'll see over a hundred billion dollars in consumer spend through the app stores on games alone. Um, and compared to all other forms of gaming, that is about 1.5x, um, the rest of them combined. So that would include PC, Mac gaming, handheld consoles, and home consoles all together. Um, and we also see when you break them out that mobile gaming is actually 2.8x the consumer spend, um, then PC, Mac gaming, the next highest level. So that is also just through the app stores. It doesn't even include um, in-app advertising or in-game advertising, which is another major draw card for mobile gaming. Now what Game IQ does is we're able to look at this in a more granular view and get a lot more, um, get a lot deeper into these insights and where that revenue is coming from. So one of the main things that we can see is that core drives the majority, uh, core games drive the majority of consumer spend globally. Um, but what's really interesting is when you start drilling down beyond that, so with the genre level, we have strategy and RPG games, and they actually drove nearly half of all the consumer spend in games worldwide not just core. Um, and within those, we also see that turn-based RPG and action RPG are the biggest drivers alongside city battle within strategy. Um, so we start to see really how these things break out and where the spend is really coming from. So looking at that subgenre level, what was really also quite interesting is we can start to look at how uh, subgenres have grown by consumer spend. Where's the highest growth sectors here? Um, and in that top threshold, we actually see that of the top four, 
we see all of the categories represented, which is really good to see. We see that there's a lot more diversity than just core games growing the fastest. We see um, within core and strategy, the subgenre city battle is growing the fastest. Within casino, we see it's within traditional and slots is actually growing the fastest in consumer spend for casino games, but second fastest of all. Uh, and again, within core action battle royale subgenre is growing very fast. And then within casual, uh, we look to the puzzle genre and match and build subgenre is actually growing quite fast. And also we just wanted to highlight a little bit of the um, sort of that granularity that we've spoken of. So within the casual genre or class actually, the simulation genre and then sandbox subgenre, we see that there's a large growth happening there as well. And that Roblox is driving a lot of that growth. That's number one. Um, and the difference to the app stores is that in the app stores, Roblox is simply categorized as adventure. Um, so we get to see a lot more of the drivers that are, are really behind a lot of this growth when you start to look at it on a segmented view like this. So this is another great feature. Um, this is Insights Generator, which we've seen in another slide before. But what I want to call attention to here is just the power of when you layer that with, um, with our game IQ classification. So first, when you look at Battle Royale games, we see that they've actually grown some of the most of any subgenre by the uh, depth of engagement, so that average time per user, as well as the breadth. So growing the total number of active users. Um, that's kind of pushed that category, that subgenre, from niche players into attention leaders. Another key one that we want to look at is sandbox. So that's a subgenre within the casual class and the simulation genre. And again, we see that time spent per user, and then the number of users has grown phenomenally. Um, and that has actually pushed it into the challenger box out of the average performers box as a category. Similar trend we're seeing is within the subgenre of card or board games, where you see that um, it's within the casual class and the puzzle genre. Um, card board games have actually seen phenomenal growth in active users. So you can really see it's more of the, the kind of um, the breadth of users versus the depth in this case. But it, nonetheless, it has pushed that subgenre far into the challenger's quadrant. Um, so this is a really great way to kind of get a competitive benchmark and to see where, how and where the growth is happening. Here's another view that's actually I find really interesting as well. So when we start looking at our game IQ data, we're able to look at it on um, both in terms of the uh, country level as well as the regional level insights that it can provide. So this view looks at top games by downloads and we're looking at themes and settings which is one of our tags, one of our modifier tags that we showed you before. Um, and that's a really, it's a great way to enrich the analysis and kind of go across um, sort of taxonomy lines and see how things shake out when you start grouping like apps or like games. So in this view, what's really interesting is that across all the markets we analyzed, across all regions here, um, we saw that fantasy was actually the number one theme or setting um, for all of these markets by downloads. So that's really interesting because I think it kind of pairs um, quite nicely with the fact that a lot of us have been stuck at home during lockdowns. And so people, generally speaking, are in need of an escape. Uh, what that escape is obviously is varying by market. So Brawl Stars is quite big in South Korea, Germany, France, Brazil, whereas Pokemon Go um, is quite popular in the US, Canada, UK. And then as a second level, you can see that there's a lot of differentiation happening um, for the number two sort of downloaded theme or setting. Uh, in Americas alone, we see that the US has casino gambling as number two, Canada has home design, Brazil, modern military. So we start to see there's a lot of diversity happening. And just to kind of reiterate, when we look at the top five across various markets, we can just see the breadth of themes and settings that are popular and are highest by, by the download count or the demand. So whether it's apocalyptic or casino gambling, sports soccer, home design, war, modern military, we can start to see um, kind of where the regional preferences lie and how there might be competitive advantages. 
Another great thing that we've done uh, that we have is the tag for IP. So we've tagged games based on their IP. And we've seen that in Japan, that some of the, we have some of the largest share of downloads um, among IP games as well as consumer spend. Um, and what we've done here is we've pulled kind of by markets based on their percentage of downloads and spend from IP games. And then we've pulled the number one IP game. So what's, in, what's interesting is in the U, um, globally, actually, we've seen that PUBG is the number one game with IP by downloads and by spend in H1 2020. But then you start to see market differences. So for instance, in the US and the UK, we see Call of Duty is the number one IP game by downloads, but Pokemon Go is the number one game by spend. And in the UK, the number one game by downloads is Scrabble Go um, for games with IP versus Pokemon Go um, for consumer spend. So we start to see which games are achieving milestones and which metrics and how that varies across different markets based on um, what some of these tags, and that tag can be monetization model or in this instance, IP. And speaking of monetization models, so this is another really great tag that we have. So looking at monetization methods among and layering that within some of the taxonomy that GameIQ provides. So we could slice and dice this by subgenre or genre, but in this case, we've looked at core overall. And one of the key things we've noticed here is that among generally most markets, uh, the number one uh, monetization method among core games was gotcha loot boxes. And then you can kind of see we've, we've pulled out different countries and there are differences among the countries. But another one I wanted to call out is advertising, which indicates um, these are the among top games by consumer spend. So the advertising layer indicates that there's a bit more of a hybrid model happening. Um, since monetizing through consumer spend, um, that's measured through the app stores. And what we'd expect for, for casual games is that the advertising monetization method would actually be um, one of the more predominant ones. Another thing that we can see here, another kind of cut, is to look at uh, the differences among, among regions and which regions and which countries are over-indexing. Um, or have a particular, um, you leverage a particular monetization method more than others. So for instance, we see that in China, um, Gasha loot boxes, starter packs, VIP and cosmetic items tend to be um, used more frequently than other markets. And then conversely, we also can see that within, again, the advertising area, um, markets like the US, UK, um, Brazil, France, and Germany tend to over-index for their use of advertising as a monetization method in core games. So that's showing that there's more of a hybrid model taking place um, and something that's very important to know, especially if you're a publisher looking to branch out from uh, like an overseas publisher, looking to branch to new markets, or if you're um, a US publisher and you're considering uh, trying to capture some, some mind share within APAC markets. This is an important thing to note because the monetization models are more prevalent um, and, and also there's a difference in, in consumer appetite. So another key thing we can look at is sort of just, again, how some of the um, some of game, how some of, some of the genres and categories of games shake out among different markets as well as different metrics. So what we tend to see with downloads is that casual games tend to dominate, uh, but you do see some of the different variation happening in some markets, which are with uh, Japan, South Korea, Indonesia, showing slightly higher levels, uh, relatively speaking, of core game downloads. In time spent, we do see that core starts to over-index a bit more in the time spent in those games. Um, particularly in, in Japan, South Korea, and Indonesia in this view. Um, and then when we look at spend, that's where we really see consumer spend. Um, we see core uh, punching above its weight here. Um, I also want to draw your attention to just in the U.S. So casino games actually represent 22% of consumer spend among top games. Um, and that's actually over indexing quite a fair bit from the amount of downloads. So casino games only represent around 4% of downloads in the US. So these are really helpful to see how the different uh, gamer preferences vary by region. And there are general trends typically across regions, but we also um, need to kind of take into account the country specific um, preferences. 
This is another great view where we're able to look at um, the genre and subgenres um, and how they map out around the world. So one of the things that we're seeing in this view is that demand for hyper casual games, which is a genre within casual, um, that it's relatively spread across markets. The, the US is number one for downloads and number one for spend, but only represents about 15% of downloads. So it shows that it's quite, um, has broad appeal globally. Um, for revenue, the US represents nearly 40% which is um, which shows sort of that kind of priority potentially for monetization. And then we look at parent HQ. So this is a good view to be able to see. So of the most downloaded hyper casual games um, across most markets, uh, many of them, most of those downloads come from French publishers. And in the US, that's what we're seeing here is that the, the more of the um, downloads of hyper casual games are actually coming from French publishers. And we can look at that same view and slice it by um, subgenre within core. So this is the city battle subgenre within core strategy. And again, we see that um, the US is number one, but it only represents around 11% of total uh, market share here. And we can look at how parent company um, headquarters plays out. A lot of the downloads of these games come from uh, publishers for, out of China. Um, and so you can see that in the US around 70% of those downloads do, um, but then within, uh, you also see that there's a, a large portion um, relative to the other markets that come from US publishers as well. All right, well, I'll quickly run through some key findings before we wrap up for Q&A. Um, so some of the things that we found particularly interesting when looking at this data set, um, starting to play around with the tool. So we found that actually hyper casual games Excuse me. Um, hyper casual games were downloaded over 5 billion times in H1 globally, um, which is a significant figure. We're also able to see that 50% of the time spent among games, um, the top 1,000 games by monthly active users, actually came from core games. And we're also able to see that um, casino games grew 40% year over year in consumer spend in H1. Uh, which is pretty significant. So a lot of people obviously staying home um, and and spending and uh, playing casino games versus going out and doing that perhaps due to COVID, um, but also a trend that's picking up over time. We also see that 20% uh, of time spent was by was in Battle Royale games, but that actually Battle Royale games represented only 3% of total downloads. And then last, we see that 80% of consumer spend in action RPG games comes from APAC markets, which is particularly important um, to understand where sort of which markets over indirect over index and which subgenres and genres. So the next steps, I'll just leave this with you guys um, to get started with Game IQ. If you're interested to learn more, um, head to bit.ly slash Game IQ app Annie. Um, or if you want to see what other insights and ways you can slice and dice this data and how much uh, you can get out of it, you can get our free report. Um, it's our latest report here at bit.ly slash report Game IQ. And with that, I'll pass back to Kate for Q&A. Fantastic. Thank you very much. Um, so we do have some questions. So the first one comes from Steve and he's asking, we all know hypercasual is the growth sector in recent years, but your data shows increased time and spend for core games. Which genre would be more lucrative overall for new studios, casual or core? <laughs> That's a great question. So I think the trend with hypercasual, um, I guess, the way we look at it is that actually within what mobile's done basically is you know democratize gaming and virtually every smartphone owner has a console in their pockets now so what we've seen is that kind of expansion at both ends of the spectrum so we've seen hyper casual being one end of that spectrum and then more hardcore being the other end of that spectrum where we're starting to capture traffic um, and migrate people who might be more uh, pc mac gamers or console gamers um, and that's due also to mobile um, having better hardware and the device specs and the capabilities as well. 
So with that, I think right now what we're seeing is there's a large audience for um, for hyper casual. It's in a lot of ways hyper casual is that first sort of um, probably dipping your toe into gaming in a lot of senses, and for people who aren't typically going to categorize themselves as gamers, um, we kind of view it as turning a lot of non gamers into gamers. Um, and so from a monetization standpoint. Um, it truly depends, <laughs> um, but both are, I mean, we see a lot of hyper casual games benefit from in-app advertising. And actually we've seen, um, we expect to see uh, even more spend in in-app advertising than the app stores overall, not just in gaming. Um, so that's a big market of opportunity. And in H1, we actually did see that ad placements grew around 70% in the US despite shrinking marketing budgets. So that's a good sign for the industry generally and also for gaming specifically because we know, um, you know, ad dollars are following both the, the large audiences but the, the ones that are engaging frequently as well. Great, um, the next question and we, let's see, we have about five minutes left. Um, do you have any UA metrics like CPI, et cetera, and ad monetization metrics like um, ARP DAU, ARPDAO in Game IQ? I could take this one. Um, yeah, so so we we do have revenue um, and downloads and uh, daily active user data in Game IQ. So we will have metrics like ARPDAO for you for you to calculate by 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 using the um, revenue in the daily active users and RPD for for revenue per download. So so that's data we do have in Game IQ. We also have data um, on other usage metrics like like Lexi was showing, like session duration and, and um, frequency and things like that. And um, in addition, we have advertising and ad monetization data, um, how apps are acquiring users through advertising and, and how apps are um, also monetizing their, their in-app experience through ads. Excellent. Um, so next question, surprising that you don't have word games as a category, can you share some insights on word games? Want me to start start off on that one, uh, Lexi? Or you want to take it? Sure. Yeah, you can go ahead. Okay. Sure. Yeah. So um, we we do have word games within within puzzles. So we have a puzzle genre, and then um, below that we have a um, a bunch of puzzle subgenres. One of those subgenres is words. We have other ones uh, like room escapes, match threes, match and builds, et cetera, et cetera. Mm -hmm. Um, so, so that is, that is one that, that we do have, um, with respect to any, any insights, uh, on word games, I'm not sure if I have one top of mind. Um, like Lexi, I don't know if you, you maybe have something about word games. <laughs> we actually, we haven't pulled anything specific to that, but I think, um, we have seen games. So for instance, uh, Scrabble Go was a big one. Um, we saw that Scrabble Go commanded a lot of um, time spent within especially markets, uh, Western markets, UK, France, Canada, the US. Um, so that was the big kind of IP launch that we saw happening in Q, uh, well, in H1. Um, so from that standpoint, um, that's a big one, but I think that's something, um, continue to look at our blog at bandy.com slash insights because we are always publishing new analyses. Um, and so we could potentially see something of that come up soon. We don't have any data pulled on that specific subgenre right now, uh, but I've just gone back to this screen here so you can kind of see um, within puzzle um, that we do have the word subgenre. So that's a very specific um, subgenre within all, I think James had said we have like about 110 different categories and subgenres. So Great. data um, to be found for sure. <laughs> <laughs> so last uh, question with a quick answer. And for all of the, there are several other questions waiting. So I'll remind people that um, after this next question, uh, which will be the last live, you can head over to the uh, PGC Helsinki Discord um, where the rest of the questions can be posted and the speakers can answer those. So the last question is, has the Battle Royale bubble burst or does it show any signs of doing so? Yeah, so maybe I I could start with that. I, I was just 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 looking up some data just to to make sure I'm I'm saying it right. So I think what what I'm just seeing is that that Battle Royale is um, in terms of downloads worldwide, 
over the past 12 months or so, it's remained relatively stagnant at really actually very, very high levels, but not super high growth. In terms of revenue, though, the revenue is increasing quite a bit. So I think this is still, you know, not losing popularity in terms of usage, but it's finding more and more success in terms of monetization. Excellent. Well, great. Thank you so much, Lexi and James. Uh, we really appreciate the session. And again, for people who still have questions, the link to the Discord is in the chat. So I really encourage you to go over there and keep the conversation going. So we are going to move on from here. So thank you again.